want to do? Did you? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to record or do you want or do you want to go and see the house first? Um, I'll record while you give us a tour. I'll just oh. Follow around. Okay. And then you can take pictures as we go, or we can do that after. Whatever works if for you guys. If that's yeah. all right. Yeah. Okay. Whatever you. Yeah. Oh, excuse the mess. Okay. So, how did you want to do the tour of the house? Um, just just okay. lead us around. Maybe uh, show us your favorite. Like, point out. Um, like, I'm sure this piano has some kind of story. Oh, okay. Uh, or like, point out your um, favorite mm -hmm. places. Just anything. You'd oh, like. okay. Yeah. Well, let's see. We moved in the house. It'd be 11 years ago. Before that, like I said, we lived on 48th and Concordia, and then before that, it was 48th and Burleigh. So, um, when we moved into this house. We are the fifth owner. The people before us had painted everything gloss white. So we had to rearrange things a little bit. But, um, oh, is it okay yeah. if you turn off the fan? Oh, yes. Right. Yes, not a problem. Thank you. Okay. So um, the house was built in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. It was built by a doctor. And he had a wife and one daughter. He wanted lots of storage in this house. And so... Um, we heard a lot of this from one of our neighbors who knew the second owners and the third owners and the fourth owners. And so we've got a lot of history here. Um, and, she, and they actually knew the original woman who lived here. I think she lived here till her death and then the house was sold. Um, so we heard a little bit more about the history. And so like original to the house are the um, radiator covers. And the fireplace mantle wasn't there. We added that. It was just flat. And it had this kind of relief of some brickwork, but it was all in the plaster. There, aren't, there wasn't any brick, it was all in the plaster. I forgot what kind of, there's a term for the type of plaster and it's, it's a little bit different than a... You might know. Yeah, what, the type of plaster <laughs> that we have. It's not a, there's a term for it. Like, maybe like, I don't know. I, I would say that's stucco. It's not, no, the, the, yeah, the outside is stucco yeah. because of the Tudor style, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but there is a, a term for the type of relief and everything. Um, so, um, so we moved. The, you asked about the piano. The piano actually, we purchased when we lived in the house on 48th and Concordia, and it actually came from Boston. And then the woman we bought it through um, brokered it through, came out of the Washington Highlands. And so, yeah, this is kind of my pride and joy. My kids laugh I, about it. Mm -hmm. I have a. I play piano. Oh, so I have okay. a White baby grand. Ooh. Robot. Yeah. Sorry. Well, you're welcome to play it. It's a oh, 1909 geez. Somer. Oh, geez. It's not. I don't know that it's in tune, but you're welcome to play it. Please play it. My husband <laughs> would go. Yes, anybody should play the piano. <laughs> so obviously we have. We can show you. I'm working on a project for a bridal shower. Okay. Um, my husband's done. Um, we're not even going to open the door because unfortunately this works. Um, but anyway, that's his little. So we have this. We've got this nice room with the paneling. Um, you know the, the built-in cabinets the leaded glass windows. Uh, there's a lot that, um, these, these great old features that we absolutely love. So we can go into the kitchen. What we understand about the kitchen is that it's been remodeled a number of times. Um, this used to be where the stove was, okay? So you can see there was a, some form of a hood. Um, the cabinet that's up there used to be here. Um, so when we moved in, you know, I think the refrigerator must have been under there at some point. There, this was a pantry. And unfortunately, we don't have the doors anymore or anything, but that used to be a full pantry, which at some point would be wonderful to have. As far as we know, the cabinets are original. Uh, when we moved in, the, the countertop was um, orange, I wouldn't call it linoleum, but it was orange with that silver edge around it. Yeah, it yeah. was, um, yeah. And the people before us put in the tile floor. I don't know what's underneath here. But as you can see, there's a lot of hardwood floors throughout the whole house. Um, so that's kind of, you know, I love, I love the kitchen. But now it's been 10 years, it's time to repaint it. But you can see we have little things here, a powder room, um, clothes shoot. You know, of course, the little nook for where there used to be the bones. Yeah. Closet space. So, yeah. So we have closet space here. And, oh, you can get the plate out of the way. <laughs> uh, this is kind of something we've been seeing is the... Very, very typical. The, the 
Mm -hmm. But um, some of the homes, like mm -hmm. from the 20s that we've seen, haven't had this. And oh. Some do. Okay. So it's kind of like a transitional thing yeah. with the technology mm -hmm. of having a phone. Phones, yeah. 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 So that's interesting. Yeah. Well, and again, a, a large closet here. We have a large closet at the front entry. You know, this is our, you know, just a powder room here. You can step through and open the door. There used to be, as you can see, all the doorways, doors at every, every entrance had a door. So we took most of them off because it was just blocking everything. Yeah. Um, that little sink. We added that because there was a, a different sink there and it was not not in good shape and we needed we knew how small that bathroom is so we needed something really tiny yeah. i've seen some ideas on how i change it up from now but um this door actually just leads to a small walkway to the backyard we found out from one of the owners that when they built the house the builders had flipped the um the plans this was originally supposed to be on the other side with the driveway Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. So the driveway, um, which leads back to just a one-car garage, there is no way, you know, to get directly to the backyard. So when we did have pets, it was it's really tough to take a dog out to the backyard. So you've got that door, but then you've got the, the French doors, and that's just a little landing there. And there's really, there's not really, there's just a huge step down. Yeah. So it's kind of awkward, you know, but to come in and out, it's easier on this side than that side. So they had flipped the plans. They just, somebody messed up. But on the other hand, it, because that lot next to us is empty, there had been a house there. The house apparently um, was destroyed in a fire. Then there was a garage, and the gentleman who owned the lot tried to build a second story onto the garage and turn it into a home, and of course, it all imploded. I mean, literally, Drew, the neighbor next door, was home when all these guys are building and she could hear something funny and all of a sudden they're all going, move, 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 and the whole thing imploded. Oh my goodness. Well, he wasn't using smart architecture. <laughs> he didn't have any supports. It was like, okay. So anyway, we have um, the, um, the closet, another closet in here as well with a mail chute. You know, and I don't, you know, mail chutes are, again are, you know, it's, it's hidden back in here. But, you know, mail chutes are pretty typical of the area as well. Yeah. So, this also has all, you know, in terms of the natural leaded glass windows, um, storms and, you know, original storms and screens. What a pain in the butt. That's original to the house. And it goes with all the other sconces on the walls. Yeah. Those are all original. So. Um, we can go upstairs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'd also like to see if you have a basement. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. If you really want to go down there, I'll be happy to show you. Come on. You gotta move, Daisy. You pain in my expression. And you will edit out some of those things. <laughs> okay. So, you know, we heard from Drew next door that the woman actually had. Um, she used the, the sewing room, and that's what I have as a sewing room, and that's so she used one bedroom as a sewing room. Are you coming, Walter? Come on. This one, if you're looking for interesting features, this one is very interesting. And excuse the mess. Oh, wow. You've got this door, or this window here, but we have, and it's, we only have a screen for that one, but this window opens out. Wow. Okay. But you've got a storm there, so of course we can't open it. And when we were going through the house, as when we moved in, trying to figure out all the storms and screens, we couldn't figure out what screen we might, or is there a screen we could put here, you know, like a temporary, and then be able to open that window for a cross breeze. Right. Very interesting. So, you know, in our, a weird architectural feature that that window will open, but it's going to go out. So, strange. Um, okay. Again, Sorry. closets. And, you know, like, uh, this, yeah, which is very unusual for the time. Yeah. Okay, this do the doctor who built this, he wanted closets. He got them. Do you want me to pull that shade all the way up so you can really see it? No. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and it's, um, I think that the second owners retiled around, the tub surround, but the floor, of course, is original. When we moved in, there was a vanity so that was totally inappropriate for the bathroom, so you know, in terms of style. So we got rid of that 
and put in the um, pedestal sink. So, but in terms of the radiator and the, and the radiator cover, that's original. And then if you come in, I don't know if you've seen a number of houses that had the tub with a separate shower. This one does not. We have a closet here. But some of them, our old house, um, and it had all the original pink and green bathroom tile. Amazing. It's, it's still in really good shape. But it had a separate tub from the shower. So, so you have a little shower. have seen that. You have it. Okay. No, oh, it's too bad I can't take you over there to see that house because it's got some original features that are fun. But again, original. I mean, this is this is original to the house. Yeah. And I'm sure the floor is original to the house as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then again, we have no. There was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's okay. I like the, uh, the doorknobs. The hardware. Hardware. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. There's it, the house since it was built in the 30s. Um, there have been people that have lived here with kids aside from our kids, and I think they've done a little, you know, wear. There's wear and tear on the house. Yeah. Yeah. It's well lived. Um, there originally the sconces that were downstairs. We had a similar one up here, and a similar one here. But there had been a fire, an electrical fire of some sort. So oh, wow. it wasn't. So we just replaced these figuring out something that I enjoyed that I, you know, would kind of go period, but really isn't. Um, again, another huge closet. Wow. Yeah. I mean, yeah, what? Story. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then we have this bedroom laid out for you. And again, another huge, huge closet. So it's just amazing what they've you know, what they were thinking. Yep, that's my favorite. When you want to know what's my favorite part of the house, the porch is my favorite. Yeah, yeah here, come on. Oh, yeah. Did you want to take a picture before we? Did you want a picture of the door uh, to show sure. how it? Yeah. yeah. You can kind of get a glimpse. Mm -hmm. This is my favorite part of the house. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you nap out here? I feel like I would nap out here. We nap here, yes. <laughs> yes. My husband, this is his escape, yeah. so he can have a little bit of rest. Yeah, and it connects to the master bedroom. That's a, so, that's awesome. yeah, <laughs> we, we've set up the furniture and just relax out here. Yeah. Cocktail hour after here. Yeah. yeah we can see our neighbors. Um, it's just, and then when it rains, I mean, if we wanted to be out here, we can pull the, str the screens down, if, or the blinds down if we want to and it's just our little spot yeah so sorry Walter you're not coming out so no it's a great it's just very relaxing yeah we need to do some work on fixing some screens and doing some things old homes always need lots of work but yeah the stucco on the house was all refurbished by the second owners they kind of told us a story about how they redid everything. Yeah. So. It's kind of, yeah. So we can go and I can show you the other. We'll go out this. Way. Yeah. We'll, go. Yeah, well, let's go this way. Mm -hmm. You gotta move, Walter. Come on. Come on. Out of the way. And so then this is the, the last bedroom. And again, original um, radiator covers. Um, lots of neat architectural features in terms of some moldings and yeah. The mm -hmm. chandelier? That I think is original. And my husband keeps wanting to replace it with a ceiling fan and I said oh. only if we can put that chandelier in the bathroom and make it, yeah, I would put that in the bathroom. But yeah, I love that. And I had to go and find replacement crystals for a lot of spots. Oh. You can see there's still one in the sink, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Original. And, and then this room too, two closets. And I've got mine, Bob's got his. Oh wow. Yeah. Excuse the extra room. Walter won't walk on hardwood floors. Really? Yes. My dog doesn't like hardwood floors either. Well, or the kitchen, you know, anything. So we've had to put all these, that's right, towels all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me just turn some lights off and I'm going to leave that door open and yeah, you can stay here, Daisy. <laughs> Kitty. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, this is the 
Yeah, that's the yeah. Here's the closed shoot, and and the, it's funny because I'm yeah, not sure why, part. but this is here's the actual shoot, but then you've got this other piece, and maybe it has to do with something else. Was and, and was then, this house a duplex at some point? No, oh no, it was always single family. Um, the at, oh, it's got a full attic too. Okay. Did you want to? Yeah. <laughs> you want to see? Sure. Yeah. Oh, there is a way to get up there. Yeah. Watch. Here, step back. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah. I just figured it was. Yeah. Oh, you can go. Awesome. Did you want to go up and look? You can. I mean, it's, yeah. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Just it's, it's, it's safe. It really is. There's anything interesting. Yeah. We let our grandsons go up, so <laughs> we know the ladder is safe. <laughs> So when we moved in, there was no, when we bought the house, there was no insulation in the attic. So we insulated the attic. Mm -hmm. We had to paint everything. It also had had no storms or screens on any window for four years. So all of our windowsills, you can tell, are kind of funky. Um, so my husband fixed all of the windows. Um, he, he had to fix some of the sashes and the sash cords, you know, for raising and lowering windows. We've had some of the lead glass repaired, but there's a lot more to do. That'll be my retirement project. <laughs> Cleaning, you know, redoing, yeah. yeah, because there's some things that's kind of wobbly, you know, how the, the lead gets, turns dust, you know, gets loose and turns, yeah. So we have a lot of that to fix, but. So, did you need to go up and see? No. I, I won't go up there. Okay. <laughs> I got pictures. Ladders oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. That mechanism just makes it, I'm just like, yeah, peeking out. <laughs> it works well. It works well. Yeah. yeah. Um. Oh, what's this? Oh, doorbell. Oh. Yeah, here. And then there's a little piece that came off of there. I just have to glue it back on. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, so you can imagine we had a door here, and it would be, if it was open, it blocked all this. Right. So we just took all the doors and things off. So you want to see the basement now? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Watch your step. Just, I have to leave the towels for water. Oh, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, you can tell at some point somebody had some kind of a runner on the stairs, right. and we've just never done anything they with just it. Painted yeah, painted around the runner. They did. Yeah. Well, that's very typical. Um, you can see where the stains were different, um, and when like our the stairway going up, we we put in that carpeting, and um, same with at the other house, we wanted runners, and you had to do some things um, because you could tell what was where the the carpeting had been or not been right yeah so it's, it's just interesting how they, they decorated mm -hmm. oh, wow yeah so. Um, yeah so come on in here we yeah. we ended up you know changing lighting you know this is I, I'm sure those are original tubs oh, you do use the laundry oh. chute oh, of course I'm no yeah. fool <laughs> let me just okay. change this real quick uh, <laughs> So, you know, they, they built in, you know, storage under the steps. Yeah. Daisy, what do you think? Can you please take it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. This room, you know, it's your basic rec room. But, you know, again, more storage. Those, I'm sure, are original. Yeah. Um, and I would think, 
Well, it's all right here. I don't know if there was ever an oil tank. I think there might have been, um, and it would have been built off of the the, the doors on this on the other side of the, because that I think that that whole cement slab has been all redone, and they, there might have been an oil tank there at some point. Because if you've talked about some of the other houses, you might have seen oil tanks, in some of the homes. Okay, because our original duplex, the heating was you know it was all forced air heating. And you, and you didn't have radiators, but you had an oil tank um, that supplied for the, for the furnace. Okay. Okay? So we had to purchase oil. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that was, that was in 81. It was still, it was still very functional. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, eventually, I'm sure that they converted it to gas. No yeah. Um, Do you ever use this bed? Like well, we just moved this down here because my, my daughter moved. So yes, when the kids come home, because we have four children, so when they're home for the holidays, somebody gets the basement room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, sometimes we've had to put a twin bed up in the sewing room. You know, it, it depends who's coming and staying. And yeah, we just got this one. In fact, my son was home for a weekend and he stayed down here, and a friend stayed upstairs. So it, it worked out well. But. Would I like to have this all rearranged and nice? Yes, but there's just the two of us home, so we don't need it. But when, when we moved in, our youngest was still in high school. So, you know, we did use this for other things, but now it's storage. So, okay. okay. Yeah. You can see over the doors, yeah. These are the doors that, you know, from all of the different spots. So there's a dining room one, and then there's... Mm -hmm. It's good that you saved those. Oh, no, yeah, we would not, yeah. In fact, somewhere behind there is actually um, a door from some of the houses on 49th Street near the hospital. There was, there's a parking lot to the east of the hospital, and that used to be all homes. And they were tearing down the homes to build a parking lot, and I was lucky enough to purchase a door because um, I was thinking cause it had the beautiful stained glass, and I wanted it in the other house. Well, we never... We never installed it, but I've got the door. Okay. Now, two days later, somebody went in and vandalized and took all of the stained glass, all the stuff that was going to be sold, you know, saved, sold, um, re, you know, repurposed. Right. Thieves came in and stole it all. Wow. Yeah. It was, I was really lucky to get a door. Because I had worked at St. Joe's and I knew the people that lived in those homes because we lived right behind there. I was like, oh, I wanted it, you know. So I have to do something with that door. But well, you can see typical basement. Um, I don't know what else I can tell you. You can see the. There must have been a different way of heating because you've got those different spots there. I'm not quite sure. Right. All of yeah. Um, and then there actually is a behind the doors. There is a clean cleaning hatch for the fireplace because it is a workable fire, a working fireplace. Yeah. Any other questions about the? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Walker, off. Come on, off. All righty. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sure. Do you have a list of questions? What do you have in mind? Uh, yeah, we have kind of some some themes to touch on, mm -hmm. but we're not going to just read you a list of questions. It's, it'll be more of like a conversation. Sure. Um, okay, step out. Do you guys want anything to drink? Um, no, I'm good. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's the. So. Um, these are consent forms. Oh, okay. And it's um, one for you and one for us. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, yeah, consent to participate in research mm -hmm. and um, sure. audio and photo. So I'll grab you again. Mm -hmm. Okay.
you didn't fill these out already. No, they're all fine. Okay. Okay, so that's you guys obtaining consent. And... No, you gotta have your. I'm picking up a lot I can hear it in here. Okay. I, I mm -hmm. can barely hear it without the headphones on, but you yeah. put the headphones on and you can hear it. Yeah. Okay. Chair. Of course. Yeah. Sit down anywhere. Make yourself comfortable. You can move the pillow. You can do whatever you want. Okay, Believe me, we're really casual around here. <laughs> okay. So, here's here's yours. Did you need to um, to do we need to do we need to fill out the other ones? No. Okay. You want to okay. No. I trust you. Okay. This is Kaylin Reed, and I'm here with, um, or I'm here at Miss Olin's house um, at 3434 North 49th Street. Correct. Um, today is July 13th. Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we are we're doing an interview um, at um, her house. Uh, also, in this room is um, the person doing all of the audio. It's Bella um, Bewer. And uh, this interview is being sponsored by Professor Regent Sin at the um, BLC Field School at the um, University of Milwaukee, and it will be stored in the Golden Meyer Library archives. Um, Ms. Olin, mm -hmm. would you please confirm that we can use this audio for our research? Yes, you can. All right. Thank you for your thank you for your time. Oh, that's at the end. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. All right. So I think first we would like to get a little bit of um, uh, your your personal history. So like how it, uh, how you came to be um, living here. Okay. Uh, the house that we're currently in, uh, we've been in for almost eleven years. Prior to that, we lived a few blocks away on 48th and Concordia and prior and that was 20 years so we've been in the Sherman Park neighborhood and then before that we lived five years in a duplex my husband and I landed in Sherman Park um, in 1981 because at the time we were looking for a home the um, interest rates were 10 11 12 percent and rising um, my husband had grown up in Whitefish Bay. I grew up in the south side in Bayview. We met at the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire and moving back home, um, family said, oh, you should live in Whitefish Bay. Oh no, you should live in Wauwatosa. Oh no, you should live in Bayview. Well, we couldn't afford any of those houses or if we could afford it, it was a cracker box. And so we did not want a house to own us. We wanted to enjoy our house. So my husband found a realtor he was looking at houses. I was in Iowa at the time. And he met a realtor who said, well, have you considered Sherman Park? And it's like, where's that? And she showed him the duplex. He put an offer in. He bought it before I even seen even saw He put the offer in before I even saw the house because I was pregnant at the time. So I wasn't doing a lot of traveling. And so we moved here to Sherman Park in um, the first week of August in 1981. Our uh, son was a week old when we moved in. And so we lived in that duplex, and we met lots of great friends because of the realtor. So then we, I worked for St. Joe's Hospital, and 
my husband did a lot of things and at about 15, six, it'll be 16 years ago, 17 years ago, um, we opened the Sherman Park coffee shop and that has really connected us and kept us to the neighborhood. The house we're currently in was owned by um, a customer and um, they needed, he and his wife split up that she needed to sell the house. We loved the house and decided it was time to get out of our other home because we'd been in there for long. We wanted to downsize a little and um, that's why we ended up here. So my husband can walk across the street to the coffee shop and as he said, he walks 142 steps to work. So. Oh, nice. All right. Um, so tell us a little bit. I mean, we've, took, mm -hmm. we've taken a tour. Um, would you, how would you um, describe, or I guess what for you makes your house a home? When we love the Tudor style, the traditional types of natural woodwork, the hardwood floors, you know, the nooks and crannies, all of those things are just, it's a style of architecture that Bob and I love. And so, but what makes it a home, I think, is just the fact that we're here. We've, our children have lived here. They bring their grandchildren over. Um, it, it's a feeling. It's, and I know that Bob and I could live anywhere and it would still be home. We could make a home anywhere. But this particular house, we walked in and we went, ah, this could, this is going to work for us. And, and our other homes were wonderful too. They were truly home. Um, but it's, it's great. We've had parties here. There's room to move around. It's, it's very separate. You've got your separate living room, your separate dining room, your separate kitchen. It's not the open concept that a lot of um, newer homes have now. But that's okay. It works. We've had Thanksgiving dinner here with, you know, 30 people, and it works. We've had Christmas with lots and lots of people, and we can make it work. So I think it's just, um, it's, it's cozy, but still gives us room to move around. Um, having a den... If my husband wants to escape, he can go to the den, if, or we can go upstairs. We love that upstairs porch, and it's a screened in. The bugs aren't going to bother us. We can read and just enjoy and be part of the neighborhood, too. So. Okay. Mm. And so you mentioned the coffee shop. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, Sherman Park Coffee Shop is on the historic registry, so if you've not gone over there, you, you know, please take a look at it. It's a, the building was a former gas station. Built in the 30s, it's a streamlined modern uh, building. So, and again, because of that architecture, um, it was the building was going to be torn down. Uh, an, an alderman was newly elected, and when she was elected, she asked the people, "What do you want? You know, if I, if you elect me, what do you want me to do?" And they said, "Tear down the eyesore." And another neighbor who's into architecture, Cliff was talking to my husband on Mother's Day of 2000 and they'd seen an article in the paper about this wonderful building and Bob said to Cliff, you know, oh, you know, great article about, you know, the gas station. And he goes, yeah, but they're going to tear it down. And it's like, why? Well, nobody has a plan for it. Well, the na other neighbors had tried to purchase the property. It was tax delinquent. It was a brownfield cleanup site. So you might learn about um, the 75103 law, which was the brownfield cleanup, where a city can take um, a brownfield site from the tax delinquent owner, and then it can be transferred to somebody else who has a plan for the building. So we were the test case for 75106, 103. Anyway, we were the test case. Um, so it took a year and a half to obtain the property um, and get it opened, but... Um, it, or I should, yeah, not quite a year and a half, but a long time. And it's now a neighborhood institution, so to speak. And we've been in business for six, it'll be 16 years on August 16th. Um, and so we had to follow all of the rules in terms of keeping things a certain way. Um, and then, of course, the brownfield area had to be cleaned up. Um, and so we've taken a tax delinquent eyesore and turned it into something that's really, really good for the neighborhood. So neighborhood, neighborhood groups meet there, people come there, we have wonderful customers, so it's a great place. Right. So, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about the people who um, come in? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, we have, you know, it's neighbors who walk. We have women who come on a Tuesday afternoon and do crafts and beading and things and knitting and sewing and talking. We have um, 
Bible study groups that might meet early in the morning, and some people will, of course, they'll drive in. Um, <clears throat> we have some customers who just come every morning for their cup of coffee. We have others who come every morning for their coffee and, you know, a donut or whatever, and then they sit and read the paper. Um, we have um, a wonderful customer who's made it his second office away from home. He is um, a very hardworking um, administrator of another university uh, department. And so when he wants to get away and just concentrate, he comes over to the coffee shop and that's become his second office And he, because we have Wi-Fi. Um, we've had art shows and art displays. We have had uh, neighborhood meetings there. We have had, um, people can rent it and do it. We've done bridal showers there and we did our son's rehearsal dinner there. And, you know, it's just, it's a multi-purpose um, building that is a coffee shop most of the time and every once in a while we use it for other purposes and it's just a great but people will walk in still who live in the neighborhood and we've been open for 16 years and they'll go i didn't know this was here because it's not it, it's quiet it's a quiet you know institution um and if you don't go down roosevelt or if you don't go down keefe or if you're not not near 49th or 50th you might not notice it um but we have a lot, at one point, um, it was definitely used by our kosher, um, the people who needed kosher because we have kosher products there um, with our Orthodox Jewish neighbors. Um, we've been responsive to what do the neighbors want. So on Wednesday nights, we have bag toss. Uh, during um, non-summer times, we will have entertainment on Friday nights or, you know, Saturday afternoons. On, um, in this, from September through May, we have Anthony, who's a local chef, and he will prepare omelets. And so it's just, um, we find out what do people want and we try and give it to them. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I have a few mm -hmm. um, questions from the others who are. Oh, like, okay. We have like how many oh, mm -hmm. Those are all on that sheet. Oh, all of the other side. The of other side. Mm -hmm. Oh, you have them. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, At the bottom. Okay, yeah. Do you think. Um, okay. So um, we have here transition from formal to informal space. So we, you're talking about your your um, the parties that you have with mm -hmm. your family um, and the boundaries that we ha that are naturally have been built into the mm -hmm. um, the buildings that we've been walking through. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about how you transition. It transitions from like formal to informal. Oh, okay. Well, the way we're sitting now in, in this room, we've got the couch angled. Well, you don't have a lot of seating space when you've got 10, 15 people that you want to have. So we have to rearrange the furniture. Um, and that, you know, my husband and I can do that in five minutes. Uh, we definitely use the dining room for, you know, formal. I'll get out the good china and, you know, we'll use it. Or other times we'll just, you know, have um, a buffet in the dining room. We'll have a buffet in the kitchen. It kind of just seems to be, it depends on the group and what we're doing. Um, Sometimes, you know, as you've seen now, I have my craft stuff sitting on the dining room table because I needed some big space. Um, so it it's a very easy home to rearrange and figure out where people are congregating. When we moved into the house um, about three months after we moved in, or not long after we moved in, it took us a while to move in. We actually took about three months to paint and do some things. And then when we moved in, we actually finished our move-in on Christmas Eve, and our kids went out and got a Christmas tree, and we made sure we still had Christmas. Um, but that following January, then, we had um, a neighborhood party to invite people because everybody saw what we were, you know, they heard we were working on it. They wanted to see the house. And so we had probably 60, 70 people come and go. And so we just, we had doors open, and we had some people upstairs talking, some people downstairs talking. We had the rec room set up. It was just it was just easy for people to move from room to room, although it got a little tight in some spaces, but it worked out. Um, and it was a lot of fun to be able to entertain. But you know, you move the tables around and you add things and you figure it out. So Okay. Mm -hmm. Um so we've been running into a lot of um where we were looking at some of our houses, some of those houses were uh, foreclosed and mm -hmm. um, shuttered. Do you see a lot of that happening over here in this area of Sherman Park? 
this how does that affect, sorry. yeah this yeah this section of the Sherman Park neighborhood I think is extremely lucky in that we have a majority of homeowners um, and they're longtime homeowners uh, the people that uh, the previous block that we lived in that I mentioned the 3200 block of 48th there are still people there um, who, who who live there when they were there when we were there 10 years ago they were there when we moved in which is now 31 years ago. Um, so you've got this longevity. Um, and of course there's some duplexes where the people come and go, but I think because people get to know their neighbors, um, it helps to keep up the property values. If you know who owns the home, whether it's a bank and foreclosed on, or whether it is just a neighbor renting out, um, if there is something going on, uh, our neighbors will call. They're not afraid to call and say, hey, do you know what's going on in your house? Um, so that, that I think, helps. Um, we're happy to see and hear about houses selling. Um, just recently, uh, there were two houses in the 3200 block of, 30, of 49th that sold, and, and young professionals moving in, which is wonderful. Um, there's a house that's not far from here that has an accepted offer on it. Uh, a couple other houses on Roosevelt have sold. So we're seeing that houses are selling in the neighborhood. The other part is the um, Common Ground has rehabbed some homes and um, sold those in our neighborhood. I think that's helping keep the, the values up. Um, when you go south of Burleigh, um, when you do have more duplexes, um, home ownership is still extremely important to maintain the value of those homes. Um, the, du the duplex that we had owned um, we lived in it for five years. We rented it out for, I think it was another five years or so. And then we sold it to one of our tenants. And she still lives there. And so, you know, it, that's a really wonderful thing because now she is probably, I think she's only the fourth owner of that home. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a beautiful, solid house. You know, the things that, that you saw, we've heard that the person who built that duplex also built... The, the one on either side of it, but lived in the house that we had. And he was a ceramic tile um, installer. So in that house, the kitchen was ceramic tile, total ceramic tile. The bathroom was ceramic tile, total ceramic, tile, including the ceiling. It was amazing, it was, and it was just beautifully done. Yeah, you know, so those are those things that you're not going to necessarily find anymore, but it was a, it's a really neat. But do I worry about housing values in Milwaukee? Yes, um, because we have extremely high taxes. Um, people and, and our school system, even though we raised our kids in MPS, and I think that there's a lot of good in MPS, Milwaukee Public Schools does, unfortunately does not draw people to Milwaukee. And um, is that going to affect our housing values? I think it is. Yeah. The housing stock, though, here in Sherman Park is so fabulous. Um, it's... I hope more people will, will see the, the value of living here. Um, you know, we don't have to have expensive homes you know, and keep raising the housing value because that's going to affect taxes. We don't want so much um, what I would call gentrification that the values shoot up and the people who live here get forced out. Um, we've seen that in other neighborhoods in Milwaukee. And growing up in Bayview, I look at the house that I grew up in, and when my mother sold it 15, 16 years ago, um, she made a significant profit from when they bought it when I was a baby. Um, but um, I know that the housing stock in Bayview has skyrocketed. I can imagine those taxes. I could not afford those taxes. Um, the taxes here in our neighborhood, based on the value of these homes, is high enough. If I were to double the, quote, assessed value of this house, I couldn't afford to stay here. Even though I have a wonderful job, um, I'm you know, gainfully employed, um, and I, you know, we couldn't afford um, because of taxes. We have to be, cons you know, we have to think about that. That's so, mm -hmm. what, what do you do for work? I'm a registered nurse. Um, I worked at uh, St. Joe's for 27 years. And then I switched jobs about, in fact, exactly nine years ago. Um, and I work now for Columbia St. Mary's um, as a wellness nurse for the Coles Wellness Center. So, and then I teach part-time for Marquette as well. So. 
Also, I was going to ask a little about your, um, you're a member of the Sherman Park Community Association. Yes. Mm -hmm. A little bit about your involvement in that, and maybe mm -hmm. um, issues in the community. Okay. Um, my husband and I have been in the Sherman Park Community Association probably since we moved into the neighborhood. Um, we've all, we'd always heard about it. We always were supportive of the various efforts. Um, SPCA was formed um, as a neighborhood association to look at housing issues. And I think that's been the backbone of, um, and getting neighbors committed and really engaged in the neighborhood engaged in um, keeping the neighborhood safe, um, keeping the housing stock um, up. And so years ago when they used to have the Sherman Park Blues Fest, um, Sherman Fest it was called, and that was, you know, we always went, we helped, we volunteered. Um, I've sat on the board a number of times. I was on for a while, then I was off, and now just recently I, I went back on again. Um, because I believe in the value of a community association, in a value of getting people to connect. And this is one way that people can get to know their neighbors, they can connect with the issues. They would have a voice in going, hey, something's going on in our neighborhood. How do we handle this or how do we improve it? And so now you've got a place to turn to. So that's kind of why, why we've stayed involved. We think it's an important um, organization. Um, I'm looking forward to the transition. We've had some wonderful directors, and we're at a stage now where they're looking for a new director. It's time. Fred has done a great job, but, you know, he's he's ready to retire, and he should retire, you know, and, and be able to say I'm leaving the, the association in good hands with a new director, with a new vision, um, with a determination to keep the neighborhood safe, to keep the, the neighborhood healthy. And it's not just um, safe in terms of, um, you know, the houses, the stock, the people, the, the physical safety. It's We want people to feel connected, and I think that's an emotional safety as well, um, to go, this is where I'm comfortable, this is where home is, I know my neighbors, I know what life is about, um, and that Sherman Park is a good place to be. So, um, so we have um, someone asking about um, stewardship of the outdoor space and mm -hmm. I mean um, your deck is definitely some place that you like to spend a lot of time in. Mm -hmm. Would you tell us about kind of the garden and Oh sure yeah um, yeah I like that word stewardship yeah. and yeah. so uh, yeah I, I think we're given an opportunity to take care of whatever we own whatever we wherever we land so um, right next door we have a vacant lot and so, I mean, that's a, a good starting point in terms of stewardship. The owner um, does bring in someone to cut the grass and do things. But before that, actually, the neighbors actually all helped with cutting the grass. Um, but the owner took over, which is what he should do. And uh, so what I've done is kind of I know where our lot line is, so I added a... Um, vegetable garden um, along the garage I added you know some vegetables I just put in raspberries I'm really excited to, and next I want to try blueberries but um, the the gardens it was bushes in front and I wanted flowers so we dug out the bushes and I've been planting flowers and we have we've been trading plants with neighbors so other neighbors will get together and it's like okay this is overgrown I got to dig it out and so we share our plants um, you know put in the annuals um, keep up with the perennials. Um, I I just think it just makes everything much more beautiful. But there is something to be said for um, working in the garden that's more of a spiritual and emotional exercise than just planting and, and picking vegetables and stuff. But it's a good spot. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you eat your food that you grow? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, in fact, I just pick peas. Um, I've got some herbs. I have to figure out using more of the herbs that I've planted. Um, but I have tomatoes, um, basil, peppers, beans. I love when the beans start coming in. Um, the peas, radishes don't do so well. I gotta, gotta work on that. Beets occasionally. But then the other part is we're lucky enough to have a farmer's market, um, at the Fondy, um, the Fondy farmer's market is just fabulous. The West Dallas Farmer's Market is another good one. So if I can't grow it, um, I know I can find it at other farmer's markets. Um, so 
it's, it's a it's a good thing. Oh, and um, so I've had this question where um, I've noticed a lot of different. Uh, so these houses have been around since um, like the '30s, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I've been interested in is how um, these spaces are being used. In, like entertainment wise mm -hmm. because obviously technology has changed throughout the years and so how this house was originally built mm -hmm. for someone's form of entertainment obviously morphs and changes mm -hmm. and how have you made your um, entertainment unique like kind of mm -hmm. the space unique um that's a good point at I, get, I think in our other house I can think more we kept we had a living room, we had a first floor den, we had a finished basement that was very much a, a, a 50s retro with the vinyl and everything. It's a pretty cool space. And that we kind of evolved because the kids would use the rec room and we had a TV down there. For when, there were, when the kids were smaller, we could use the den as a TV room. When the kids got bigger, we just took up so much more space that then we had to have the living room for our TV room. This house is different in that um, our den is my husband's office, so we don't have a TV in there. Although, you know, he has it set up so he'll have music playing and he can do that. We have our, our TV here in the living room. Um, you know, having flat screens is kind of nice, and at some point to be able to have it mounted and covered up would be even better. Um, we have a TV upstairs, but we rarely use it. It's kind of sitting there gathering dust. Um, it's, I think, more it's radio. Is I still like to listen to a radio. Uh, or now, because of my iPhone, it's like, okay, podcasts and uh, Pandora work really good. And, it, and so you, it does change. I, I hadn't thought about that. But our use of media certainly is changing. You know, I have a, a laptop, but... During the school year when I'm teaching, I use my laptop more. But now it's like I'm thinking I, I got to get a an iPad, and I want you know I want to be able to use media differently. So so that it is actually I would love to have it much less conspicuous, um, and and not sitting out. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Good point though. Mm -hmm. um, how are we, Vella? How are we looking on time? We're at fifty-two minutes. So we've got plenty. Okay, of time. so we have. Mm -hmm. plenty, yeah. I have a lot of questions. Yeah, so if you want to ask some questions. Maybe hit him that she mm -hmm. gets some inspiration. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you already kind of explained to us the um, your use of the basement. Mm -hmm. um, we saw there was a workspace down there. Mm -hmm. Does your husband? Um, does he, does he work down there often? When things need to be fixed, that's where he goes down to fix them. I think as we were touring, I, I said how all of the windows had to be fixed, all of our storm windows. So a lot of glass had to be repaired. Things, I mean, we, he had it set up down there so we could, he could repair the glass, then we could paint them, get them ready to be put back up again. So he really had a nice setup down there for that. Um, like I had a project where I took an old sewing machine cabinet and turned it into a little mini bar. And again, we set it up down there. We were able to do that. So yeah, we use the workspace. Um, it's kind of cluttered right now and needs some cleaning out. But I tell you, finding time to clear the clutter. When you saw the attic, it's filled with too much stuff. It's like, I want to get rid of. I would like to live leaner. Um, but when you have a large house, boy, it's easy to fill up the space. You know, all these wonderful closets, it's easy to fill them up. So, I also, think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, continue. That's okay, no, go. Mm -hmm. um, so, most of the uh, work you've done on this house has just been restoration? Cosmetic, right? I would I would call it more cosmetic. We okay. were lucky enough that um, the woodwork has never been painted. Um, the windowsills need some work because, again, water damage after not having storms on them for a number of years. Um, a previous owner had repaired and um, all of the outdoor stucco. Um, we had we've painted the house. We now have to go to round two. There's a lot of um, um, 
there's some rot in some of the boards because it is it's an old house we've had to replace some of the cedar um and timbers and we're going to have to do some we've got a couple more to do but um it's the nice part is it's that everything we have to fix is fixable and it's stuff that my husband and i can do um at some point, you know, would we remodel and, and maybe redo the kitchen or have a doorway with a, with a deck to the backyard? You know, I mean, those would be things that would be really fun. But I would only want to do, want to do them if they were architecturally um, congruent with this Tudor style. Um, I, I wouldn't want to add something that doesn't fit with the style of the home. It's, you know... That would be sacrilegious, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and we just love the house. Um, so. Mm -hmm. And um, these floors are slightly different. Um, I'm not sure what type of wood they are, but they're different than all the, the woodwork. woodwork. Yeah. So were these we, floors? We, we redid the floors. Um, my husband redid, I should say my husband redid them um, four years ago. Yeah. Okay, so is there an original hardwood on it? This is the original hardwood. Oh, it is. It is. It just, he sanded it and then um, stained it a, just a, wow. a tad different color than the original wood, than the woodwork that you're seeing. Uh, we went with a little bit different color. It's yeah. a great shape. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, they're in beautiful shape. These are all original floors. Um, and in all of the rooms, as far as, as far as we know, every bit of woodwork, every bit of flooring is original, um, except we don't know what's under the kitchen tile. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, also, um, I mean, you talked a little bit about when you moved into this home. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe uh, talk about uh, your like personal early life, like where you grew up, those mm -hmm. kinds of things? Um, sure. I grew up in Milwaukee, and I went to um, school. I, I lived on the south side. Like I said, I lived in Bayview. We lived um, just two blocks from Lake Michigan, and it was it was it. Actually, you know, based, you can tell by my age and stuff, based on things, I remember sitting on Superior Street watching some of the National Guard go by during the 1960s, during the riots of Milwaukee. So that's some of my recollection. But it was a really easy time to grow up because we walked everywhere, we rode our bikes everywhere. Um, so my summers and time off was spent South Shore Park, Sheridan Park in St. Francis, Grant Park, in South Milwaukee. We rode our bikes everywhere. Um, and so now here in today, I'm excited because my husband and I have our bikes and we do ride our bikes places. Sunday morning, I got on my bike and I rode to the east side to go to church. And so transportation in Milwaukee is, it's kind of fun that way. We can ride our bikes places. And I feel safe even going up and down Capitol. Um, but I grew up, you know, just having what what I thought was very typical. There were six kids. You know, we had a three-bedroom house with one bathroom. Um, and, you know, we played outside. We we had one car. Um, you know, I guess it was just, to me, which, which was a, seemed to be a very typical. The expectation was that we would um, go on to college. So my sisters and brothers and I all went on to college. Um, my f parents were teachers. My dad was ill for a number of years. Um, so, you know, we didn't travel as a family until later. Um, so it, it was an interest, you know, to me it was just very typical. And it was funny because the we took the buses places too. I grew up at the south end of the 15 bus line, which was, was like the Delaware, um, the Oakland-Delaware was the bus route. Um, or the Hampton, or it was also labeled Hampton. Turns out my husband grew up, grew up at the north end of the Oakland, Delaware, and, you know, the Hampton route. And so we, we laugh about, about that. Um, and for him, growing up in Whitefish Bay, um, he had a, a little bit different perspective on things, but at the same time, um, he knew that growing, you know, moving to the city to really being Milwaukee residents was something that he embraced, and we've enjoyed um, being part of the city. So mm -hmm. at one point we looked at selling, we had a, a, a potential buyer for our house on 48th and we were going to move to Whitefish Bay um, for the schools. Uh, we weren't sure where our, our daughter was going to go to high school. Our oldest was ready for high school. We didn't know where she was going to be able to go because it was a lottery system. 
uh, once she got into Rufus King, we could breathe easy. And then um, it turns out that the buyers decided not to move from California to Milwaukee. So the house, the sale of the house fell through. And we always said it was probably the best thing ever because moving to Whitefish Bay, those house, that house would have owned us. We wouldn't have owned the house. And so it probably, you know, it wouldn't have been a good thing for us. And our kids got a great education. Um, one of the things that we really haven't talked is about the integration, you know, and Milwaukee. Um, they talk about Milwaukee being the most segregated city in Milwaukee, in the, in the nation. But we, because of where I live, I don't feel that because we have neighbors. It's an integrated neighborhood, and it's always been that way, and our kids have grown up that way, and they feel that this is normal. This is the way we should, this is the way we live. This is the way we should live. Um, we shouldn't look at people for what color is your skin. Um, or, you know, you live on a poor side or, an, or you didn't go to a good school or whatever. It's, um, this is, I think helped all of us to realize that regardless of race, regardless of, um, sexuality, um, you know, the whole shebang is, um, we are all human beings and we all should live together in, in some form of peace and harmony. And, you know, maybe we all have our quirks and we're not always going to like everybody, but we accept everybody or, or should be. And it's been wonderful that way. I think that's been a great philosophy for our children to grow up with. They, they see normal. At one point, my daughter said, well, why would we move to Shorewood or Whitefish Bay? There aren't any blacks there. I mean, there were, but you know, she didn't see it that way. And so it was like, okay, cool. Glad you're talking that way. I mean, we grew up going to, you know, she grew up in a church in, in Shorewood. So, you know, she did see that, you know, she recognized right away that, hmm, things aren't the way they are in our neighborhood. And it's been good, so. Um, yesterday I interviewed mm -hmm. um, Deborah Ford Lewis. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she talked quite a bit about... Um, the, the 60s and the riots in the 60s. So oh, she okay. Did that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so could you maybe tell us more about that or how that had an effect on you as a kid? Or, uh... Well, uh, yes, because I would love, in fact, I need to talk to Deborah now and get her perspective because we've not talked about things like that. And it would be wonderful to talk to her and find out her perspective. Or maybe I'll listen to her interview. Uh, but growing up on the South Side, I was really young. Okay, um, I also grew up at Immaculate Conception Church. And one of the children of the church, so to speak, was James Grappi. So we're talking Father Grappi. His younger sister, Darlene, was in my class. I didn't know much about that. I mean, you know, we were kids, we were playing. Didn't know much about that at all. But when the riots came, I will tell you, the biggest thing that affected me at the time was one of my girlfriends had tickets to the concert to see the monkeys. The concert was canceled. That was a big deal at the time because I didn't understand. We didn't, you know, my parents might have talked about it, but growing up on the South Side, you were either Catholic or public, you know, so you went to a Catholic school or a public school. We didn't really know people of color. Um, and we were very insulated. If you left Bayview, you might have gone to Mitchell Street to go shopping. You occasionally went downtown. Um, you might have gone to Capitol Court um, for shopping, um, but that was for a special occasion. So we really didn't know, as a child, I didn't know what all the ramifications were. As an adult now, I, I have a better understanding. But interestingly, when my kids went to school at King, when my daughter got her driver's license, the first day she's like, okay, it's my husband coming home. Um, she says, mom, can I take the car? Okay, sure, go ahead. And she picked up her friends. One lived in Sussex, one lived in Brown Deer, one lived near the airport, and one lived on 92nd and Beloit. So you can imagine from Sherman Park going to four corners. She had to pick up all her friends. Then she had to take them all home. and. Then she said, oh, next time I do that, I'm going to fill up the car with gas while their friends are still in the car so they can help pay for it. It's like, yeah. But she had these wonderful friends all over the place. So we're getting to know our friends, and they'd bring their friends, and we were in the basement, and one of the girls um, we met is Anna. 
and we're talking and on it's like oh she says her last name was grappy i said oh well did, you know you know do you know darlene i never made the connection well it was it's james grappy's daughter mm -hmm. and so we got to know her mom and got to know more of the stories and her mom has done books of of and talked about um the civil rights movement and she's got some poetry about that and she's done book readings at um the, sh the coffee shop well then a young man came um, to one of a kitchen table conversation that was held at the coffee shop and he talked about going to James Grappy High School and I said do you know who James Grappy was and he kind of had this look of not really so I was able to talk about you know how we knew them through other ways um, but other people who've been in Sherman Park um, marched with Father Grappy, when he was Father Grappy. They marched with others in the civil rights movement. Um, people that we've gotten to know have this history with, um, you know, all of the civil rights marching, um, but not so much about the immediate, you know, their involvement. We haven't talked very much about any, any involvement in the Milwaukee riots of the 60s, but, um, the, you know, more of the, the national civil rights picture. Um, in fact, there was just somebody else who recently passed away who we found out marched in the national civil rights. And it was like, wow, to hear those stories. Um, really important stuff that people kind of kept hidden. They, you know, once it was passed, they just quietly went on and did all of the work um, of making sure that people had equality but didn't talk about their involvement. So, yeah. So, my, you know, I have a very south side perspective of things, um, so I'll need to talk to Deborah and find out hers. But, you know, it's amazing how things kind of come around. So, yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you so. have any more questions? Um, I, no, I don't have any. Okay. But if, mm -hmm. you'd, um, if you have anything... Um, at the end of the interview, get, that you just would want like to say that we forgot to bring yeah, up. Something that um, forgot, yeah, something we forgot. Hmm. It'd be interesting. I think maybe including some things. I guess I'd like to know your perspectives because here you are, young people. You're coming from not from Milwaukee. <laughs> you know, you're coming from you know south of the border, shall we say? Um, and you know, what is your perspective of Sherman Park, having studied it? having heard about our uprising from a year ago, you know, what's your perspective of the Sherman Park neighborhood? Can you talk about that? Yeah, I think <laughs> um, so. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew very little. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, this, this whole year I've been doing research mm -hmm. um, on the, the Washington Park and Thurston Woods areas, but mm -hmm. I never really spent a lot of time there. It was mm -hmm. kind of like back-end research mm -hmm. and um, you know I feel like my perspective has really changed really being in the communities and mm -hmm. talking to people because you know the media only gives one story and so that's kind of the goal of our research is to get stories of people that the media doesn't hear mm -hmm. you only hear there's riots and there's shootings and you don't hear about all the, the good work that's mm -hmm. happening mm -hmm. um, so I've really enjoyed it so far. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. Yeah, and I've lived in Milwaukee for a year, but mm -hmm. it's been just on campus. Mm -hmm. So obviously it's uh, very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and, the, and any campus is a unique community in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're getting a, it's nice to know that you're getting a broader perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what about for you? Yeah, I've been here for four years, and mm -hmm. I've gone through a lot of... I've actually... I've watched gentrification happen, mm -hmm. which is very interesting to me. And um, I, I think um, Sherman Park wasn't really on my radar until the riots... Mm -hmm. uh, the riot actually happened. And that's when I... Um, I didn't know it was happening at all. I was just sitting in my living room just nothing nothing mm -hmm. was happening and then i was getting phone calls from everybody asking me if i was, I was all right if things were happening like if i was being safe and you and were so living where at the time i was living on oakland um about 
it's like a 10 minute walk from campus. Sure. So you so were, I was on the east side yeah. and I was nowhere near any of that. Yeah. Um, but that's when I started doing a little bit of research trying to figure out what mm-hmm. was happening. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I read about the riots. I read about the shooting. I read about what happened. Mm-hmm. And so I kept looking at this community and I noticed that national news, Milwaukee news was showing all the violence. Mm-hmm. But when I kept looking at this community, I, they nobody except for the local news mm-hmm. covered how the community of Sherman Park cleaned up everything mm-hmm. before noon the next day. Mm-hmm. And like that's that just showed kind of how the media is kind of just trying to skew things, mm-hmm. trying to show just one story. Mm-hmm. And so um, I had never actually visited um, Sherman Park until mm-hmm. until this class. And but I had that thought in the back mm-hmm. of my head that these this is a community that very that cares about the community very much. They do. And so just talking, we were at a, um, a Saturday festival at, um, mm-hmm. it was in Washington Park mm-hmm. or Sherman Park. Okay. It was mm-hmm. actually in Sherman Park. Oh, okay. And, um, just going around talking to people, you show it, just everyone cares deeply for their community. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's something that I feel like some communities on the east side people who i talk to so just the difference between perspectives Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as like i talk to people on um the east side i talk to people like where to live i'm i'm moving soon Mm -hmm. so they're like oh don't go don't go too far west like don't go past yeah basically yeah they're like don't go west of the river Oh, come it's on. Like, River West? A, oh, you would yeah, love River no, West. No, River West is, I have... You, said, we would love to have you move here, but yeah, yes. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> one day when, yeah. I, uh, when I'm making a little bit more, yeah. yeah. But um, definitely, like, it's just people who just see the, that one story, they see mm-hmm. violence, and they think it's, all, it's violence all the time. Like, you yeah. won't be safe mm-hmm. at all. Um, and it's just, I think... This is what we're doing now is going to be so important because we need to get stories like this out. Mm -hmm. We need to kind of open people's eyes to just how wrong, I guess, their perspective is. I mean, we we need to show. Well, and that's it's telling the stories. I think getting when you when you talk to someone and you hear their story, you suddenly learn that, oh, my gosh, look at all we have in common. Or, wow, what did that person endure and what have they gone, you know, and look at what they're doing with their lives. So it's always stories. Um, I worked for 10 years as a faith community nurse. And I worked for a church that is no longer Pentecost Lutheran Church. It's now, the building was sold and it's a different church. But for 10 years, I worked with this elderly population. And even though some of them lived in nursing homes, um, they would come back to the church. Or Or I would go visit them and we would talk about the neighborhood. And the stories they would tell about living in Sherman Park and the connections we had was just, it was so fascinating. You know, the small world types of stories. One gentleman, Clyde Bachman, knew the owner of the gas station that is now Sherman Park. And he told the story of how the residents wanted a park there, but the owner wanted to build a gas station and he knew the alder pre- and he knew which wheels to grease to get that to become a gas station. And Clyde and Agnes built their home on 58th Street. It was the first house to be built on their block. So they're in the, uh, I think it's the 3400 block. But they're, so they're just south of Keefe. But he talks about, he talked uh, stories about how everything north of Keefe was truck farm. So vegetables. He knew that the end of the city was the cemeteries at the, on the other side of 60th. And he said, when our house was up, Agnes and I were just standing there, this, and there weren't any other houses up. This car comes driving down the street, pulls up in front. Two ladies get out. They look around, and one of them goes, why would anyone want to live in such a godforsaken area? And then they got in their car and drove off. And Clyde just laughed and laughed, telling that story. But he did. And then there were others that another woman from the church I know lived across the street, um, Another woman I cared for, this story is just talk about um, how connections. When we lived in the duplex, to the south of us were some elderly women 
their nephew would come and cut the grass. And he had some things of his mother's that he was selling. And he said, oh, I have this dressing table. And it was like a kidney-shaped little table with a big mirror. And, and I thought, oh, that'd be kind of fun to have as a little piece of furniture. So he sold it to me. And years later, I was talking to a woman from Pentecost. And I said, Loretta, tell me where you lived. And she told me what street she had lived on. And I said, well, you must know so-and-so. And she goes, oh, that nice young man. And not a week later, he drives past our house, our next house on 48th. And I said, oh, hi, how you doing? I said, I met Loretta. And he says, oh, and we got talking. And he goes off. He comes back later and he goes, remember that dressing table that I sold you? Loretta had given that to my mother. So then I'm talking to Loretta's daughter, and I said, you know, to Cindy, I said, I have this dressing table. She goes, oh, I remember my mother sitting there doing her makeup and her hair. I said, well, would your grandchildren want it? And she goes, no, it went to a good home. You know, it was just the, you know, what a small world that, you know, here's this woman that I knew later on until her death. Um, but, you know, there was this connection. So now my daughter has the dressing table in her home in Iowa City. So, small world. Wow, yeah. uh, but those are the types of connections that people make when you start asking them questions and, and hear their stories. So. Well, I, um, I have noticed that I feel like people here are more connected and talk more mm -hmm. with each other than on the east side. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting because mm -hmm. people would think, oh, it's a bad community. Yeah. Oh, people are always asking, are you safe? Are you sure? Yeah. The day of the riots, um, oh, I, I should tell you that Deborah Ford Lewis, we got talking about, well, where do you live, Deborah? And she told me, I said, oh, do you remember Myrtle and Lois? These were two more parishioners. She said, oh, we loved Myrtle and Lois. She knew my parishioners. Mm -hmm. You know, again, small world. And she was, she says, oh, we used to watch over them. I mean, here it was, this, these older women. Um, but the day of the Sherman Park uprising, as they like to refer to it now, we had a bridal shower for my niece at the coffee shop. People came from all over, people who'd never been in Sherman Park before. So they got this wonderful impression because the riot hadn't happened yet. My sister was here and they drove home and they actually drove past the site of the shooting at five o'clock in the afternoon, never knowing that anything had happened. We went out that night and to the east side, we were coming back, and I knew my car was low on gas, and I almost said, honey, you know, we gotta fill up the car, but let's go over to the one on fifth, because I knew that the gas station owner had been having problems. I wanted to support him. I almost said, well, let's go there and, and fill up with gas, but it was easier to, to just drive a different block and get gas somewhere else. And then when we got home, we're in bed, it was 11 o'clock or later, all of a sudden we get calls from our kids going, are you okay? It's like, why wouldn't we be? What's going on? We're upstairs sleeping, had no clue about what was happening. Then the news comes on, and of course, then everybody's calling. But it was so interesting that our children heard about it from other places before we even knew about it. Yeah. Um, very, yeah, just very interesting how that all evolved and... Um, but And then we heard from people all across the nation, are you guys okay? Well, yeah, why wouldn't we be? Because we knew that even though it was only a few blocks away, um, we were safe, that our neighbor, you know, that the people who did the damage, I truly believe, were not Sherman Park residents. Yeah. They, they were not they were nice. people who understood what our neighborhood is about. And so, you know, that was really the sad, sad part. And I think it escalated because it was an opportunity for, for some people to take things that didn't belong to them and that they felt that they were entitled to whatever they wanted to do because somebody else was upset about an issue. That was a very legitimate issue. But they were piggybacking on that mm -hmm. just because, oh, well, we can make a statement or we can do it because. Right. So, um, yeah, strange. But I'm glad you guys got a really good experience here and that you really have seen a wonderful side of Milwaukee. This really is an excellent place to live. I'm so happy we raised our children here. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. I mean, we did have that 
Mm-hmm. Ending statement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ending <laughs> you got to wrap it right up. Right yes. Mm. All right. Well, yeah. Thank you for your time. And uh, well, we did the further questions. Um, mm-hmm. All right. In conclusion, this has been uh, Kaylin Reed uh, with the 2017 BLC Field School. This interview will be archived at Golden Meyer Library. Uh, and thank you, Mrs. Orland. Mm, you're welcome. Happy thank to do this. You. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>